In fact, I think I'm like, now that I think about it, now that I heard the recording thing, I think I'm like four weeks behind posting Wednesday nights online. Uh -oh. I'm sure people are out there crying right now, wondering where the next installment is. So I better get on it. Don't want to disappoint my fan club. <laughs> All right. Um, so what is this? What is this passage about? If you had to sum this up, I'm guessing most of you have heard verse 89 before in some context or heard it said. It shouldn't be that unfamiliar, but I'll read it and we'll pray. And then we can talk about what is this about and what it means for us today. What should we do with this? And this is what it says. Your word, Lord, stands firm in heaven forever. Your faithfulness extends from one generation to the next. You set the earth firmly in place, and it is still there. Your rules endure to this day because everything serves you. If your instruction hadn't been my delight, I would have died because of my suffering. I will never forget your precepts because through them you gave me life again. I'm yours. Save me because I pursued your precepts. The wicked wait for me, wanting to kill me, but I'm studying your laws. I've seen that everything, no matter how perfect, has a limit, but your commandment is boundless. And that's what he says. So we'll pray and uh, think about what he's talking about and what it means for us today. Dear Lord, we come to you today. Jesus' name, help us to hear your word, to want to make it real in our life, and through your spirit, help us to apply it and to, uh, to discern what it means for us and help us to have the same heart the psalmist has for you in your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, what's it about? What is he saying here? What's his, what's his, uh, what's his point? I'm good. Well, God is, um, he's a blessing, he's faithful, and yeah. uh, he's a provider. But what does it mean? What's like, what's the first line mean? It means his word. Um, his word is so. Is what? His word is solid. Okay, his word is solid. It says, like mine says, your word, Lord, stands firm in heaven forever. And it's one of those, um, this is poetry. And with poetry, I've mentioned you know, probably too many times, it's it's all metaphors. So you can, there's a lot of things you can you can do with it. And if you try and if you try and like nail it down to one little tiny specific thing, you might be sort of missing the, the imagery. Like another translation says, forever, O Lord, your word is firmly fixed in the heavens. Yes. It stands firm in the heavens. It's settled in heaven. Mine has settled Okay. in heaven. So does this guy seem like, well, let's just think about what's going on, what's going on here. Does this guy seem like he's... He's happy and singing in the rain, or does he sound like he's <coughs> clinging to God's word because of some difficulties in his life? It sounds like he's having some difficulties uh, based upon what he said uh, uh, in 95, the wicked await for me to destroy me. Yeah. So it sounds like that he's, you know, uh, feeling a little stressed. Yeah, if, if you think people are waiting to destroy and kill you, that usually is a good indication that things aren't going well in your life. So yeah, I mean, so he's... Is that so, you're really paranoid? It sounds like he's direct... Go ahead. It sounds like he's directing his thinking to the overarching truth, you know, kind of taking taking a broader view of, of uh, things. So is to draw his attention away from um, these other deta painful details. Yeah, so when he says your word in that context of, you know, that's where he's coming from, right? He's he's really hopeful. He's not full of despair. We've seen him full of despair before. Like last week, he was sort of full of despair. Like, I can't I can't make it anymore. I'm like, I'm like this this dried up wine skin that's shriveled and blackened and burnt to a crisp. Yeah. Like that was despair. This isn't despair. This is it's almost like a joyful 
almost a joyful determination, even though he is going through difficult times. So in that context, when he says, your word stands firm in heaven forever, it seems like he's rejoicing that God's promises are always going to come true. So when he says your word, he's not talking about a single word, like the word the or the word whatever. He's he's talking about the message, your message, like your your promises uh, are they're firmly fixed and we can count on them. Like they're never going to move anywhere. You can take them to the bank. You can trust them. They give you hope, right? Sometimes, um, I don't, that's, this is not an issue in this church, but some, this is a good example that this isn't the point of the, of the passage. So I'll just throw this out there and then, then leave it. Some people who think that God's word is preserved in a particular English translation of the Bible, like the King James, will use verses, will point to verses like Psalm 1989. And they'll say, see, God's word is fixed and it never changes. And God has blessed English speaking people through this particular Bible version for so long. Uh, it's proof that he doesn't want his word to change. So therefore, everyone needs to use the King James Bible as the only translation. And if you hear arguments like that, does that seem to be what the point of this passage is? That when you read Psalm, when you read verses 89 to 96, do you get the impression that the guy who wrote this wrote it so that today we could take it and make it mean that we need to use the King James Bible? Do you think that was his point? Well, he ends with your commands are boundless. <clears throat> so that's really, I mean, that's saying there's nothing that's restricting there's no interpretation that's going to restrict your thoughts. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, you're, you're right. But I mean, the, the, you should, red flag should always go off in your mind if someone tries to make a verse say something that has nothing to do with anything the guy's talking about. Like, mm -hmm. this is not what this passage is about. This is about God's pr promises that they give him hope, that your promises are good, they're sure, I can grab hold of them. And that's what sustains me your 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 promises your faithfulness the, the next verse so i only bring that up not because i want to talk about bible translations but we could if we wanted to but just to say that people not through evil motives but people will sometimes latch on to one little verse and make it say something or mean something that when you read the context it's got nothing to do with anything it's like you know the story of the three little pigs remember the story mm -hmm. so imagine if someone took the story of the three little pigs and the part where they all went off to seek their fortune okay they all went off to seek their fortune and took one sentence of that and said see how evil the mother was because she kicked them out of the house and sent them away empty-handed with nothing and if someone said that you'd say that's not what the story is about and that's not what that sentence is about and you're crazy like there's nothing to do with anything so when you see someone do that with the Bible, don't tell them they're crazy, but just be like, you know, that's not, that's nothing to do with what's being said. You can make it say that, but that's not what it's saying. Just like the, the three little pigs, mom didn't kick them out of the house and banish them with a shotgun and tell them never to come back. It's not, it's not there, right? Yeah. It's not the story. So, well, I mean, I was taught wrong in the Bible about things even from the church that was a sound Baptist church, very conservative that they actually thought they were teaching right and they had taught things that I was been told are legalism but it's funny because uh, one of those things that I'm taught like really strongly I just got a totally different twist on it from a pastor on TV where he totally blew the whole thing out of water, they didn't even know what the heck they're talking about, mm -hmm. they're adding to the Bible without even really knowing that they're teaching wrong because they totally misunderstood certain scripture and they're teaching what they think it's saying, what they think it means, and it's totally not even that at all. I mean, it was like, a, it was one of the major things that they used to harp about. And mm -hmm. uh, to me, that was like, whoa, really eye-opening. I know that might be slightly different than what you're talking about, but <laughs> I just uh, triggered that memory. Yeah, yeah. You know, no, 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 no pastor, no Bible teacher, no church is always right about everything all the yeah. time. And if you never change anything about, mm -hmm. if you never nuance or change anything or grow in your understanding yeah. ever, 
Like not one single thing has ever changed about your understanding of God, the mm-hmm. gospel, the Christian life from when you, from when you were 20 to when you're 65, yeah. there's probably something, there is something wrong because, you know, we, we grow, <clears throat> God leads us into truth yeah. and to understanding things more. So um, my whole, my only point with, with that was I know verse 89 is, has been used for that before. So I just wanted to use it as an example of if someone just want, if some people sometimes will take one verse and use it out of context and just you as a normal person, whoever you are, you can just look at the context and see if that really not, that's not what the passage is about. So you can have, have wisdom to just set that to the side and dismiss it. If it looks like it has nothing to do with what's actually being said, just remember the, th- the three little pigs example, and then you can, you, it's the same sort of thing, but it happens and we can do it too, because we, yeah. we have, um, we have blind spots sometimes. Well, I like pastors that I respect pastors that say, you know, if there's something that I'm teaching that you don't quite agree with, or you don't understand, they welcome you to come talk to them about it. And the other thing is, I had a close friend tell me, he goes, Brian, you know, you know, it's supposed to be in church like a lot of people. It's like a, um, a baby, birth with, baby bird with their mouth open waiting to get fed, but they never actually even question her research what the pastor taught. They just believe it the way he said it, the way he taught it, just because mm-hmm. faith, well, it must be true. He knows what he's talking about. He's, been a, he's a pastor, but he's still human. And you can teach, end up teaching the pastor something. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's that's true. <laughs> what does? Verse eighty nine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, see, there it is. There it is. But the point. Sorry, I didn't mean to go off on a ten minute um, detour. The point. This guy. This this passage is about hope in God because His Word says so. Trust God's word because all of the promises are there. God has given us his word so we can read it and be filled with the same hope in bad circumstances that this guy experiences. And that's that's what he says. Your word stands firm in heaven forever so I can trust it. Yeah. I can count on it. And we know that's what he means because in the next verse, he talks about your faithfulness extends yeah. from one generation to the next. I can trust you. I can trust you. You set the earth firmly in place and it's still there. So it's not the trust that um, that you get from someone who's just trustworthy. Like a, one, like someone like, like me or someone like the person next to you who we might try and do our best to, to own up to our word, but sometimes we, we fail and we mess up. But God's, the trust that we can have in God is much, is infinitely better he, he established the, the, the earth and set it in its place on its axis to spin around in relation to all the other planets that are out there. And it's still there and it's still doing it. And it's still going. You're in verse, what do you guys think about verse 91? My translation has, your rules, ex, your rules endure to this day because everything serves you. What do you think about that? What? Everything serves him. That's a really open-ended statement. Mine says um, they continue this day according to your ordinances. Okay. Uh, Alan? Where everything serves your plans. Everything serves your plans. Okay. What translation do you have? NLT. Okay, that's why. Yeah. It's the one and only true version. (laughs) Yeah, the NLT is the true (laughs) true English. Yeah, the NLT is a... I really like the NLT. It tries to... It tries to translate like everything because you can see like mine. Uh, where is mine? Um, you know, the other translations leave it a little, you know, a little open ended. Um, uh, all things serve you and his is everything serves your plans. But it's like everything that happens, everything that happens in this world, everything that God has made serves him. Well, that's really interesting to think about. So if someone tells you that if, if, if you're tempted to believe that something happens that's outside of God's control or plan, you should think about verses like this and a million others that even if we can't understand that everything in this earth is serving God or under his control 
in some in some real and tangible way. And his point here is not to make us think about philosophy, but it's it's a it's a source of hope. Like no matter what happens, I know that everything's going to be fine because your promises are good and you control everything that happens. Everything serves you. If your instruction hadn't been my delight, I would have died because of my suffering. How about that? <clears throat> the only thing this guy has to hold on to is that he knows he can trust God because he reads God's word and that gives him hope. Like he'd have nothing left. He'd have nothing else to cling to. All of God's people always like instinctively turn to the promises in his word when they go through difficult times. I shared before, and I can email it to you guys if, you, if you'd like. I shared a few weeks ago that story from Christianity Today about those kidnapped um, Nigerian uh, Christian girls from a boarding school who were kidnapped and taken captive by, uh, by militants and held for nearly a year or perhaps over a year and how they sang gospel pop songs to one another um, to encourage one another, uh, gospel pop songs and shared the, the, a Bible or two and you know, smuggled it around to each other. Uh, people turn to God's word for hope, yeah. not to, you know, God, give me a vision so I can feel better or necessarily just touchy feely feelings from the Holy spirit, but they turn to God's words. So they can have comfort. Or spin it and open it right up so you can get direction. Yeah. Yeah. That, that either. Yeah. Yeah. So it's You're kidding me. people want to, <laughs> people want to turn to God's word for hope. And it's always been that way. And here the psalmist says the same thing. He says he would have died because of his suffering. It's the only thing that gave him any hope. And it's not the word itself. It's the fact that the word contains promises from God. It's the word is the, the word is the, the scripture is the vehicle to connect us to God and his promises. It's how God communicates with us and talks with us through the spirit, through the word by the power of the spirit. And then in verse 93, he says the same thing he said before about how the scripture has given him life. So what's this mean? I will never forget your precepts, verse 93, because through them you gave me life again. What life is he talking about? Salvation? That's what I was wondering. Mm-hmm. Yeah, is, it, is he talking about salvation or is he talking about like hope? Like now I see now I see hope. Mm-hmm. Like that song, I can see clearly now the rain is gone. Mm-hmm. You know, I, 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 I have hope and I see how God's going to get me through this or is he talking about salvation? Probably hope. That seems to go better with the topic. That's if it was salvation, it'd be kind of out of nowhere. Well, my interpretation says, for, for by them you have preserved me. Yeah, mine says, um, you have revived me. So, yeah. Revived me. Revive us again. I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have revived me. What's yours say, Kim? I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have preserved my life. Where, what translation do you have? NASB. Oh. Uh, my phone, I have NIV. That's what I thought. Yes, you have preserved my life. Okay. Yeah, well, yours is wrong. So anyway, no, I'm, just, I'm just kidding. I, 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 bow, I, I, bow, uh, I bow to the NIV translators. They're much better than me. He's just saying that he's in God's hands for yeah. his life, for his um, his health, his mental happiness, his... Uh, his joy, his security, his um, everything is in God's hands, and you know that. And he's actually, um, I guess, really appreciating that that's bringing him hope that he knows he has, that he's in God's hands. Yeah, it's um, it's as though what he's saying is, in Kim's translations, are getting at the same thing, maybe just from like a slightly different area. But he feels like he's, um, he felt like he was going to die or he just felt like in despair, right? But God's word is the thing that has given him life, that's preserved him, that's, that's helped him through and just given him a, a new perspective. It's like the, the sun is shining 
and he feels he can go on now. Mm -hmm. And that's what God's word has done for him. Well, I also think it, it's a form of strengthening your it, strength. I think it's emotionally strengthening to, to um, be in the word and, and to praise God this way. It brings, uh, affirmation you're you're being in, uh, you're affirming to yourself that um god is real that his, his word is real and and so it's also strengthening his spirit i think too yeah. definitely yeah it makes me think of like a, a newborn baby that is sustained by its mother's milk totally dependent and it's that milk that actually makes him gives him life, gives him hope. He knows it's coming. He knows it's there. Count yeah. on it. Yeah. You know, and um, Peter uses the, the milk analogy a lot. And so does the, the writer of Hebrews too. You know, the, the, like God's word is milk that, that makes us grow and, and, and feeds us and gives us life and revives us. He says, um, I'm yours. Save me because I've pursued your precepts. And I don't, I don't think he's trying to say like you owe me, like God, you owe me. So, so do this. I think he's just, I think he's just saying, you know, I, I love you. It's clear that I love you because I want to do what your word says. So please save me and help me. Verses ninety four and ninety five are the only time he really mentions his problem. This is a, this is a, this is like a a happy psalm in the context of difficulty. But it's not dark. It's really happy. Mm -hmm. Last week was dark. This is, he's turned a corner and now he's happy. Mm -hmm. The wicked wait for me, waiting to kill me or destroy me, but I'm studying your laws. Again, the only thing that gives him hope is that despite his circumstances, he can read God's word and see what's in store for him and the promises. And that gives him hope because the God who made everything in the in creation is more powerful than what's going on in his life than the wicked people who are waiting to destroy him. And verse 96 kind of sums up the whole point of, of this. What would you say verse 96 is about? This is another one of those that could be translated different ways. And I think all of the, all the ones that all y'all have are try to wrap their arms around it. Mine says, I've seen that everything, no matter how perfect has a limit, but your commandment is boundless. Mike says even perfection has its limits, mm -hmm. which would refute the King James Version only from the first first. Just Lines keep going to the bottom. <laughs> right. Lines right. New King James, it says exceedingly broad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what, what's verse 96 mean? No matter what translation you have. J just to be fair, I'll read the King James. I have seen an end of all perfection, but thy commandment is exceeding broad. What's it mean? What's he saying? Oh. Well, he's seen limits to perfection, but God's word is exceedingly broad, meaning it just, it goes on. It's, and it's, it's living. Mm -hmm. So it goes um, beyond perfection. I think no it's limit. so broad you can't see the limit. Yeah, yeah, that's I think that's that's true. It's limitless, you know. Yeah, limitless. You know, there's there's nothing um no, nothing's ever perfect here, no matter what you do, but God's word is limitless, it's boundless. Um that's that <laughs> expresses his heart. So if you like and I've said this before, but if, if you ever want to know, what should we think about God's word? We usually think about going to the passage from uh, 2 Timothy or going to 1 Peter uh, about how God's word is inspired and how you know, holy men of old spake as they were moved along by the Holy Ghost. And that's true. Those are really good passages. But if you really want to know what God wants us to think about his word, you should just look at all of Psalm 119 because it's all stuff like, like this about how God's word is, um, you can count on it because it lasts forever. God is faithful. Um, his word should be our delight. Um, it's the thing that gives us hope, that gives us life when we're going through very, very dark times. Um, nothing in this world is perfect, but God's word 
is is boundless, is limitless, is exceeding, is exceedingly broad. Um, what does the NIV have? Boundless, without limit. Um, you know, all these ways to 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 try and express it. God's word is limitless and it's full of hope and full of promise. And like Janine said, it's it's limitless because it's not like a static thing. Like it's not a rock. It's not just this, this, this physical thing that just sits there. It's, it's alive because it's the conduit in the vehicle through which God speaks to us through his spirit. He makes the word come alive and applies it today in a different way than he might've applied that same text two years ago, because now you're a different person going through different things in a different time. It's not that he shows us stuff that was, that, that it's not like he makes new stuff that wasn't there. He, he shows us the implications of his word through his spirit. So scripture is alive in that respect. It's a vehicle. It's a channel. It's a portal to connect to God through which God speaks to us by the power of the spirit. That kind of goes a little bit along with what I've been mulling over with verse 93, because I feel like a lot of times you can read over verses like that to say, you know, I'll never forget your precepts for by them you've revived me in a way that you're thankful for the revivement and you're going to academically in a sense, you know, never forget. But really, when you read 92 and 93, it's like there's an emotional connection to his precepts. I'm not going to forget this because through it, you've revived me me which means through it he he was revived and that he's going to remember that how that how that was <laughs> does that make sense i don't know if you know what i mean by that just because yeah sometimes it can seem dry but really you hear the heart when it's like you know your laws sorry my husband just walked in <laughs> my dog's barking um but you, you know if you're if your law hadn't been like life and i would have perished in my affliction i'll never forget your precepts because by them, you revived me. Anyway, it just, it, you can, you can kind of, um, I don't know, roll over that quickly, I think, and not um, soak it in in the direction that I think the author is actually really trying to convey. Yeah, yeah. Um, one, well, does anyone else want to, anyone else have anything to comment on something she said? I just don't want to run over any other comments anyone has. Well, I was just thinking it's like three-dimensional. It's not yeah, it's not just one dimensional. It's like it's always in motion, mm -hmm. and how it's even the names of it, the word, the law, the precept, the testimony, the commandments. It's like broad. <laughs> yeah, I you know what something Wanda said is really is really important about how this is like a there's a real living connection and and um, th there there's emotion here. And sometimes um, it's hard. It's hard to express all. It's hard to express all of what Scripture says uh, well all the time. And so, when people, when teachers, when pastors, when like the vibe of a church can sometimes go off too far in one direction. And there are churches that are very intellectual because their pastor is like a really intellectual person. Of course, that's not our church, you know. So. Um, that where where God and and it's all very Puritan like, right? It's all cold. They wouldn't say it's cold, but the whole vibe is this relationship with God is I need to believe X, Y, Z. And if I believe those things, everything is good and everything about God, everything about your relationship with Him is very cold and is very, very icy and very um, like there's no there's no warmth. Right. It's just all very cold, logical, analytical God. Um, you can have churches that tend that trend that way. And I think we do need to love God with our minds. Right. That's one of the things that God said in Deuteronomy six that Jesus agreed with. We need to love God with our minds. But there's more than just this cold intellect about your relationship with God. It's the guy here. He loves God. There's warmth. And I'm not I'm not naturally like this warm person like I've had pastors who would cry in every sermon like you could just tell like every sermon he's going to cry at some point 
Like that's not me. I don't know if you guys figured that out yet or not. So You're I, a cold-hearted man. I am. I'm a cold-hearted <laughs> snake. Look into my eyes. So the point. I mean, so I'm not a, a warm. I don't have to cry during the sermon, but I know my fears. My secret fear, which I'm now you know recording for the world to see. My secret fear is that um, I can present a really cold analytical demeanor mm -hmm. so i try to not be like that mm -hmm. but i always fear that that's like that that's an imbalance that i need to, to correct mm -hmm. my point is that when you, you you can learn how we should love god how, how we should think about a relationship with god by seeing how the bible portrays people interacting with god and like mm -hmm. Wanda said verses 92 and 93 this is not a cold relationship this is really warm relationship. There's real love. And so when you see something like this, when you get to the New Testament and you see the Pharisees, that's so far away from anything that this guy in verses 92 to 93 is feeling. And that's why Jesus is so upset. It's not that they believe the wrong things. I mean, that's part of it, but it's, there's no love. There's no heart. There's no, their idea of God is so, it's so mercenary. I, it's the checklist thing. And that's so far away from what the heart and the love you see in verses 92 and 93.